Tom Gilb, welcome to the Agility Island podcast. How are you doing today? Pretty good uh, coming out of COVID. <laughs> so, Tom, thank you very much for coming on the show. For people who aren't familiar, they should be familiar because, as far as I'm aware, the most, if not all, of the signatories of the Agile Manifesto, plus some other notable people who weren't there in February 2001, they consider you to be the grandfather of Agile, I understand. Well, in the sense that my books introduced them to the ideas and gave convincing evidence that they were useful. Yeah, they particularly point to a book called Principles of Software Engineering Management, 1988, that had considerable history of the use of agile methods in software and other areas. So maybe that convinced them there was something there that they ought to take a hard look at. Indeed, it, it seems to me uh, that you're you're ahead of your time. You were talking about all sorts of ideas that some companies are only getting used to now. <laughs> the right. the kind of the laggards, if you like, are already getting used to now. But you were involved in the very early days with fairly big organisations as well. That brought you to writing, eventually writing the book Success, which you wrote for a friend. I understand we're going to talk through that book today, and it's a delightful yeah. digest of little kind of ingredients, if you like, that are kind of mixed together, the potion put together for us. So how how can we, as practitioners, be better at eliciting what stakeholders really, really need, who the right stakeholders are, and uh, how can we solve customer problems, opportunities, and threats, and so on? So delighted to have you yeah. here today. And just to kind of set a bit of context. Well, a, a, a little bit more background about the book, because the friend I wrote it for is a very senior person in the agile business. He's been at the core of many of the newer agile developments, but he's also very frustrated by bad practices and sharp practices and things like that. I said to him, uh, you know, stop using your energy to fight bad practices or poor practices. It's time to pivot, which is a really big agile swing. Huh? And uh, he said, what do you mean, Tom? And, uh, and I said, well, ask yourself a very simple question. What does everybody want who's out there interested in some form of agile? Don't they want success in what they do? Yes. Don't they want success even if they don't do any form of agile, good or bad? Yes. Well, why don't we just focus on the success bit and leave agile to... Uh, fend for itself to show that it contributes to success, and if it doesn't, dump it. Hmm, not such a bad idea, Tom. I said, I'll write a book for you to make it very clear that we need to shift or pivot our focus to being successful in our projects, not to doing agile. So I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. It's really good, and uh, I'm making the link available as well in the description of the podcast and the YouTube version as well. So, Tom, I just wanted to talk about some patterns that I've noticed, thing, I guess, with requirements, elaboration, citation, and so on. A couple of popular approaches, one of them, user stories. Uh, so extreme programming started talking about stories, and user stories would now be a popular approach for eliciting requirements or desirements, as Ken Schwaber would say, and kind of complementary practices you can use. So Mike Cohn really popularized it. I believe Rachel Davies was involved in coming up with the, the template bit. I'm not sure who claims the credit for that, but I know Rachel Davies was involved. Mike Cohn, very famous for writing books on the topic and lots of video and social media on that. And essentially, in user stories, they try to be clear about who the item is for, what people want, well, the person who's identified wants, the role, the persona, and why they want it, which is kind of a nice way of kind of remembering things, I guess. There are some problems around that. Some people don't bother putting the persona, they say, as a developer, as a product owner, and they get a bit lazy and they might as well not say anything. But it's a template that's there for people, and people who are professional will really think a lot about the personas before they brainstorm those. And so it's a popular approach. I'm not saying it's a good or bad approach. It's a popular approach that people use. There's another approach as well, which I've seen quite a lot, which is given when then statements popularized by people in the communities around behavior driven development specification, by example, automated acceptance tests. And given a particular context, and they, they list out all the assumptions, which I really like in the given piece. And then they say, when something happens, and then, then what should happen kind of thing. And you can feed that with tables as well, which is quite nice. You can, you can automate those tests, which is really, really cool. So there'd be the kind of two popular approaches. You can also annotate wireframes, of course. You can 
writing free format. The danger of free format is that, you know, what will you write and so on, and you want to forget things. And what I've noticed, Tom, is there's a kind of um there's kind of a split between people who like user stories and people who like giving one then statements is the most popular approaches. There are other approaches, of course, that we're going to talk about today, including what you've worked on. And what I kind of noticed is that people like the idea of writing down some placeholder items with a view to coming back to them later. So, And because a lot of people like to write, write placeholder items, that means they don't have much specifics when they make write the placeholder. So they have a tend to have a preference for user stories. And then later on, they might rewrite them as given one then statements, or they might just rewrite the acceptance criteria as given one then statements. And so that's kind of the what I'm what I'm seeing emerging, Tom, with a lot of people who come to my classes, good or bad, right? So what do you think about these trends, Tom, about people using user stories and give one then statements in, in that kind of way? Okay. Now there's nothing wrong with having a, a short form of a requirement. I use it myself as a starting kit in developing a good requirement. The danger is when the most detailed form of the requirement is highly ambiguous when it contains designs rather than real requirements and nobody does anything about it that's the real danger so you need to process the requirement i use my planning language language to pro process the requirement beyond what i call the user story or ambition level and i go down and define for example it as a scale of measure with points on the scale that you wish to achieve for improvement in, for example, security or something in the future. So the problem is ambiguity. The problem is stating a means rather than an ends. And the problem is a lack of discipline and knowledge of what a good requirement is. Indeed. And I've also noticed, Tom, that even when people write user stories, I had it only a few days ago, actually, in a training class where there was a chap in my, one of my classes and he was really struggling because he wanted to do good things. He wanted to write better requirements for want of a better expression. But he was kind of in a swamp of teams who had no appetite to care about the customer. <laughs> That they were writing, breaking <laughs> items down into subsystem level, almost, do you know what I mean? Kind of almost activities and outputs, kind of completely forgetting what problems they're trying to solve. It's something, and sadly, that I see quite a lot. And to the extent where sometimes I have to keep going, going, going up the requirements hierarchy quite, uh, quite high, actually, until I find where the real value is. That results in lots of dependencies and a bit of a mess, quite frankly. Well, there's something that people have entirely forgotten, except competent organizations and that's there is such a thing as a review or quality control of requirements okay i wrote a whole book on it called software inspections in 1990. now if there is no review if people are free to write whatever they please just to tick the box yes i have written a requirement then extremely poor quality requirements will inevitably be the norm 99% of the time. So a review has to review the requirements against a standard, like are these completely clear, quantified, unambiguous starter kit there? And do they state exactly who the uh, stakeholders are for the requirement? That kind of thing. Those would be the rules for the review. And if a requirement fails those rules, it needs to be marked as a defective requirement and rewritten. Now, even in a very advanced world, the world of Intel, where they use my planning language for writing their requirements, they use this review, we call it specification quality control. And even then, they find a very high density of defects against these rules, even though the people are trained to avoid them. They're trained on a two-day course in language to write clearly, for example. And even though they're highly motivated because they know the review is coming up, even though they've had a previous review which has shown too many defects, they still commit the defects and often have to run through a series of four review cycles before they get to the exceptionally high, almost perfect quality of a requirement required by Intel. In other words, total lack of any review whatsoever is like uh, giving a kid a... Uh, extremely fast car on a highway and said there are no police within or speed traps within miles have fun 
Yeah, it's interesting, Tom. You just reminded me that when I talk with software developers, for example, they talk about, you know, they write the code and then they they write their unit tests and they do their code review and so on. I don't see, I don't hear so many people talking about reviewing the product backlog items of their Scrum, for example, or the work items of their Kanban. And so there is a pattern that's an activity that's highly recommended in Scrum called product backlog refinement, where you'd spend some time every sprint of its Scrum teams and they might do two afternoons a week. Tom or uh, less people would stop uh, maybe down tools for a day or half a day during the middle of a sprint to actually review the items together to to get more detail, to get down to another level of detail, to listen more examples, to understand what, pe- what problems you're trying to really solve, all that kind of stuff. And what should be happening is you should be looking ahead maybe two to three sprints kind of thing. And so that when an item comes into sprint planning, you know, it can be deemed as it ready to be to be acted upon. What a lot of people forget is that in Scrum and sprint planning, for example, you still have time to do refinement even at that opportunity, because it's quite a long time box, eight hours for a one month sprint. For a shorter sprint, usually shorter, but could still be eight hours. And so a lot of people forget actually that there's still a chance at the start of the sprint to actually really get clear about what it is we're trying to do. But in ideal situation, you're already clear. It's like we've talked about this three or four times already, like uh, let's just crack on with this, right? But what I don't see so often that you pointed out to is this idea of a review of how good are the requirements. What I have seen, Tom, is I have seen a thing called definition of ready being used, but I've seen it being kind of weaponized where they say, you know, you can't bring it in because it's not ready, you know, kind of way. And so what's your reaction to that? I mean, have you, have you noticed this pattern of teams where they do refinement? They have these definitions of ready, but they actually turn it into a gate. Is that something that kind of what you're looking for, Tom, that you actually want it to be a gate, that you, you do yes. want people to start yeah. something unless they're absolutely clear what it is? In my method language, in the competitive engineering book, which everybody gets a free digital copy of, We have an idea we call exit and entry conditions and exit and entry processes. So it's a part of rigor. Uh, It's it's part of making sure you got the job done right the first time. Okay. And these are, these are uh, based on things like uh, the reviews. And if reviews are showing up too many defects, you don't exit. People don't get their work commissioned or allowed or approved. And uh, that motivates them. You know, that's, that's embarrassing. And they go back and do the jobs more properly until they get the job done. And, and if necessary, they learn how to get the job done properly. By the way, those who are motivated to do this have taken the trouble to statistically look at the connection between defects in requirements and defects in code and delays and bugs in the system later. And they found that it's, it's, you know, it's very roughly 10 to 100 times cheaper to deal with this problem up front with specification quality control and exits than it is to suffer the ideas downstream. Now, people who don't know this because it's a widely known, widely published phenomena are immature. They are going to be late. They're going to blame something else or somebody else, and nobody will be any wiser because the culture doesn't care. Okay. But lo- I mean, it pays off hugely to do these reviews in terms of saving time and getting stuff done right. Managers like chief technical officers who don't deal with this and make it happen are not competent chief technical officers. The programmers of the world in their world of Scrum and user stories are not going to start instituting this regime on themselves. So that brings me over to your book, Success, because um, on page six of the book, there's a section defining success up front, which is kind of what you're talking about now. And I'll just read out what I see here. You say, here are some of the components of defining success of any project or process. And number one, a set of quantified value objectives, how good we aspire to be in the future. These are quantified with conditions. And then a set of constraints. Some of them are binary, that limits to activity, and the other ones like resource budgets, time, money, people, with conditions, and so on. And then a set of conditions expressed in a scale and scale qualifiers, like to define who, what, when, where, how for the requirements, objectives, and constraints. And, and you mentioned that this planning language will enable us to give a modify a precise definition of success and failure. And so can you give us an example, Tom, maybe of something like that? Let's say I wanted to 
upload a video for software developers to understand more about value and requirements in practice. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, so let's just focus on the value objectives and leave the other stuff yeah. out as uh, necessary, but not time for now detail. Okay, so value objectives are anything that your stakeholders, which you could have 200 or 50 of, value. Now, value means ultimately they'll pay you to build <laughs> in simple terms, or they will not pay you if you don't build is the other way of looking at it. Okay. Now, value objectives, simple way of thinking about them for us techies is that they're qualities like security, safety, transparency, reliability, usability, anything illity, right? So th those are typical things people value. Now, the thing we've noticed about the values is that they're all variables. That is, you can always say, well, I want to enhance that value, or that value is going down in a bad direction. Okay, now that implies there is some way to articulate this value numerically. And we do that with a thing called a scale of measure. So if I want to say my car goes really fast, I could say in miles per hour. I've now articulated a scale of measure. And somebody says, well, but how many miles per hour? I say 300. Mm -hmm. Ooh, wow, I'm properly impressed. That's better than what I thought very fast meant. So it's as simple as that. But what we get here is extreme clarity. And we get clarity of purpose. Now, if you don't have clarity of your purpose, you don't have clarity of success, and you don't have clarity of failure. That means you can do anything you'd like, no matter how bad it is, and nobody will say you have failed. They can't. There's no nothing to hang it on. And you can claim success, and they won't, since they don't know what it is, they will say, well, that sounds nice. Uh, good. Let's move on. Okay. Long story short, the idea here is that we need to define the success criteria and the constraints, by the way, are a kind of failure criteria, right? If you exceed the speed limit, you have exceeded a binary constraint. That's 2.1. And by defining success and failure up front, your designers, architects, managers can work towards it systematically, get constant feedback on whether they're approaching it or not, okay? and be able to tell whether they have achieved it or not, and brag about it, quite rightly, if they get there. And most people, most I mean, 99% of all the projects do not have this simple idea in place of quantifying, say, the top 10 critical stakeholder values, putting a number on the success levels that are given, you know, by the end of the year, Within 10 years, you can have long range and short range numbers there and saying we have now defined what it means to succeed. We have some constraints in there which tell us what it means to fail. We're going to operate in that environment and it will motivate us to work towards success. It'll motivate us to not waste our time doing things that do not lead to success, incrementally agile. Okay. It will be a very much more cost-effective or efficient way of working in software development. Thank you, Tom. You kind of summed up what's on page eight, actually, of your book, where you talk about the principles of success planning and definition. And it starts off with uh, realistic goals that success must compromise using engineering trade-offs to deal with conflicting stakeholder needs and to deal with the limited resources cannot be perfect, optimized, or, or maximized for the few. So, for example, having five nines uptime might be ridiculous when you're at 90% uptime at the moment. Continuous updates. Success value levels must not be locked in to a past situation, but must be updated to reflect our latest available knowledge. And forward projection, success value levels need to reflect the future environment of the system. A rapid adaptation, a critical a success value can be specified in order to engineer the ability of the system to rapidly adapt to new or improved requirements in the future. And requirements specificity, success requirements can be success-specific tailored for the specific stakeholder requirements. There's a point made here that I want to, I want to hammer in. The moment you start yeah. declaring that what is critical will be quantified and that we're going to engineer the ability of the system to 
do these things. I'm making a move from a craft known as programming, sometimes falsely called software engineering when it's programming, coding. And we're, we're saying this, the size and complexity of the systems we are currently dealing with are huge compared to what they were in the early days of IT. And as with very many other disciplines, when you get to a certain stage, the skyscraper instead of the summer cabin, you have to go to engineering. That means rigorous, systematic thought about what you're doing. That is what we're failing to do. That is what we're failing to train is real software engineers. That's what the chief technical officers are failing to employ is an engineering paradigm and people who can do the engineering. So let's make no mistake about it. We have to, when we're tired of failing, and one recent nice book on the subject with 16,000 projects called How They Make Big Things by Bent Flugberg found that less than 0.5% of his 16,000 projects, many of which were IT, had achieved delivering the benefits on time and under budget. Okay, 0.5%. So we have an incredibly high failure rate, whether we measure it or not, whether we talk about it or not, it must be very embarrassing. And it's time to stop failing and start succeeding. Now, people who want to be really good managers, really good leaders of technology, need to shift to the engineering paradigm so that we get the stuff done right early. Indeed. And that leads me on to the secrets of success in page nine of your success book. You say, number one, a clear, agreed definition of the state of success. And then number two, a systems engineering architecture, conscious quantitative design towards clear objectives, so designing for success. And then decomposition into much smaller things. So things you can do next week, for example, not like three months time and risk consciousness engineering. So for every architecture idea, taking the time and trouble to analyze and specify the success potential. We might be talking about impact estimation tables later on. We're kind of touch a bit more on that. And priority engineering, we use our analysis data to compute the best overall value of architecture with the, the remaining budgeted resources. So you're trying to carve what's right for the budget that you've got. But crucially, you have scientific inquiry engineering agility can you tell us a little bit more about scientific inquiry and what you meant by that you kind of going plan do check act plan do study act territory is that where you're going tom yes yes in simple terms and one of the big problems we have with the practiced agiles like practiced forms of scrum is that they do not have any numeric hypothesis about what's going to happen And they do not have any numeric measurement, feedback, and reconciliation of the difference between what they've achieved and what they were going to achieve. Now, that's the scientific inquiry bit. You have a hypothesis, you do experiments, you measure, and you think about it. That's agile as it should be. That's agile as I described in my 1976 book, Software Metrics, page 214. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of your books are still on Amazon as well. And you've got quite a repository up on LeanPub as well to make sure those links are available on the, in the podcast and video description. But on page 12 of your book, you've got the secret of avoiding failure, which I find interesting. And basically what you're saying here is that we need to deliver the most cost effective increments first. Yes. Yeah. But a simple idea. And and do yeah. we really yeah. find that well articulated in current agile variants? Further, you you have some principles as well, right? So you have no evil, outsmart evil. So I think you're talking here mm. about to what's tolerable, but I yeah. guess what's below tolerable is failure, right? Yes, no evil. That's the definition of these failure conditions, the constraints we talked about, yeah. and outsmart I- evil. What I found is one of the most powerful things we can do to control costs and quality and, and, and uh, deadlines is designing to cost, designing to quality, designing to time. And it's a lost art. I mean, I don't know where anybody is trained, any certificates for it, but the power of the mind to find a really smart design is terrific. I mean, everything can be improved by a factor of 10 
by applying a smart mind for about an hour. That's outsmarting evil. <laughs> yeah, and you also have choose good, which is prioritizing low risk partial strategy increments in your values and things you could do next week, basically. Respond quickly. Yes. And then crucially, you said limit losses. And this rings a bell with me because I listened to Taleb's book, Skin in the Game, last week. And he's saying, you know, that successful traders, they bet when they're profitable but not when they're desperate, you know what I mean? So it's like, otherwise you're... Uh, <laughs> and you're saying, you yeah. know, just spend 2% of your wad, basically. So you're, you're not making... Uh, yep. Basically, it's safe to fail experiments, right? Right. You skipped quite quickly over point three, choose good. And it says here, prioritize low-risk partial strategy increments to build mm -hmm. high delivery efficiency value accumulation. There's a lot of words there. If you are numerically estimating the value you will deliver for the cost you will deliver it, okay? Mm. And you have a choice of 10 different things to do next week. And you always mm. choose the one that has a little surplus there, a little profitability, a little a bit of efficiency. Then number one, you need numbers to do this. You can't just say, let's have a vote. That's a little bit sloppy. You need to have estimates for how much safety will it deliver next week, okay? And at what costs will it deliver it next week? And this is engineering, suddenly. It's not personal preference or throwing the dice or something like that. I guess I'm alluding to planning poker here or something like that. So now the point is, if you systematically are prioritizing delivery of high value, low cost things, you cannot end up with anything less than a value stream until you get to the point where you can't deliver anymore. But then you've already delivered things successfully. You don't have a big bang problem, all or nothing. You've already got a value stream going and maybe you can get it going again. Indeed. And then on page 15 of your book, you talk about stakeholder analysis. I, I, I had a, a problem with this years ago, Tom. I worked on some massive initiative for a computer factory in Ireland. And it was all, it was a bit too good to be true, Tom. Like everything was fine. It was like not a blip of downtime, not even slow time. Everything was just perfect. But it was too good to be true. No one's something's too good to be true. It is too good to be true. It feels like it's too good to be true. And uh, we forgot about the poor accountants at month end. They couldn't close the month. <laughs> <laughs> there was a panic two days before month end. And so, yeah, you've got a big section on this about who are your critical stakeholders, making sure you identify all of them and what they value and keeping this process forever for the system lifetime as well. You're continually checking who are the people we need to look after and what they're, what they're particularly worried about. Do you have any tips for people and how people can do that, Tom? Well, first, your chief technical officer has to make sure there is a stakeholder analysis process, not a customer and user process. The problem with things like user stories, use cases, user experience, is it's totally focused on one of many types of stakeholders. The rest of the critical stakeholders will kill your whole project alone, even if your user's dead happy, okay? So we've got to move away from this childish, immature, small-scale thinking where user is at the center of the world, they're important, of course. And take a look at the reasons why our projects are late, over budget, unprofitable, and things like that. And those are the other critical stakeholders. Okay, So there has to be a stakeholder analysis process. It should be based on known stakeholders in your company, in your business. You should build lists of the known stakeholder types and their known critical values, the things that trip you up, your lessons learned from failures earlier. And you should rigorously analyze what their values are, especially what I call their critical values, the ones that will get you into trouble you don't deal with them. And this is rigorous engineering analysis of stakeholders we're talking about. By the way, cultures that are very good at this are like NASA. You know, they know they have 500 different stakeholders and they know they must analyze them rigorously or one little O-ring will blow up the whole rocket in front of everybody. Indeed, yeah. You did some work with Boeing as well, did you, Tom? Quite a bit. Six years the, ago. Uh, the aircraft company. So they have Boeing adopted uh, not least 
my methods of review of their engineering drawings. That is overnight from me demonstrating the power of it and then measuring it to thousands of engineers doing my specification quality control. We have a case studies both in McDonnell Douglas, which later became part of Boeing down in California, and in Renton in Washington mm -hmm. at Boeing, where my father used to build airplanes during the Second World War. <laughs> he engineered them. Ah, cool. Now look at page 17, value requirements. is an example there of value requirement to do with air quality. I think it was to do with London or something. Yeah, Greater London. Yeah. Yes. I remember looking for a house, Tom, in uh, London, and I ran I ran out of the house when I saw this thing inside the wardrobe. I said, like, what's going on here? What's that? It was an NO2 filter. There was so much traffic outside that an NO2 filter in the house. Can you believe that? <laughs> no. Wow. Yes, you yeah. say so. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I read, I call this the nitrogen oxide lane. Yeah, yeah it's a well known road, A40 in London. So you have the uh, air quality, the yeah, nitrogen oxide in London, it's from 2022, and you had an ambition level of drastically improve air quality in London to acceptable legal levels as stated in the Paris Agreement. The scale is the number of persons who reside in London boroughs dying from exposure over time to pollution per year in an area. And the meter was recent hospital records from London hospitals for deaths by pollution exposure related illness. And you have the status and you have what's tolerable and what the goal That's is. That's a constraint. So what... That's, that tolerable is yeah. a constraint. That's the evil border. Uh, okay, so the status at the time was nine and a half thousand people overall, and that was twenty nineteen. And the well, of the older generation, it was one point five uh, fifteen hundred people. Tolerable was two hundred people in five years, and mm -hmm. then for children, it was a lower. It was one hundred, and you were specific about the pollution being NO two and carcinogens in the Greater London area for twenty twenty, and the goal. I guess what you're hoping is that the number would go down to. Yeah. So yeah, that, that, that's it's, defining it's good yeah. or success Yeah. by 2028. Yeah. Okay. Ah, yeah. 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 Very nice. Let me try to pop in a little joke. I was once <laughs> working for the Norwegian Veritas, which classifies ships all over the world for safety. And I was working for the board of directors at the top level of what they were going to do. And it turned out they had something like 400 seamen died each year in ships that had been approved by them. So that was the status. I then put in a, as a trial goal that within 10 years, only 200 people would die in their ships, half the amount, right? And it was then put to the board of director as an improvement for the whole corporation. They were quite shocked that I should ask them to plan to kill 200 seamen on their ships. Yeah, yeah. But at the same time, you have to aim for something that's realistic as well, don't you? Yep. So, yeah. It's difficult yeah. to get down to zero. I don't think they're down to zero yet. Yeah. We just talked about constraint levels. So what's what's intolerable, what's tolerable, what's success, what would be a stretch. You talk about that. But then what really struck me that I think what a lot of practitioners will find really interesting is you have impact estimation tables. So there is mm -hmm. cost estimated against the budget level, and you have a level of uncertainty about the estimate, I guess, but also the credibility and the credibility of the source of the evidence. So if there is evidence to back up where, how we're getting on, how credible is that evidence? And that's that really struck me, actually. Now, now notice that how evidence did you come up with that idea, in, Tom? Well, it's all over academia. Every paper ever published by academics has plenty of references to the evidence for what they're saying, okay? So it's a scientific, academic custom for good reason, and it's used by engineers, too, to make decisions. In fact, I've got a whole book on evidence I'm just about to read. <laughs> so it's out there, not to mention legal evidence. I mean, don't, don't we watch detective stories on television and things like that? But the place where we don't seem to have evidence is in IT, where we are not evidence-based, although we have management who probably would say, yeah, we want to be evidence-based but they don't make it happen in their IT projects. And so I'm again talking to my friend, the chief technical officer, make sure that people who are speculating with your money and your reputation as a top manager, give evidence for whatever they're proposing. 
So Tom, just on the impact estimation, I get the whole idea about the evidence there, yeah, that's fine, but it's the the whole notion of an impact estimation table, where did that come from, that idea ah, that maybe the okay. estimates aren't so solid. You know? Right, yeah. right, yeah. right, right. Now, I'll tell you the truth. I was at Royal Festival Hall in London listening to a Christmas choral concert, and I wrote down the elements of this on the back of my concert program. It came to me from my muse. I'm not kidding. But uh, the other part of the story is I started doing things like this early in the 60s based on engineering done at uh, Tom's TRW Systems by Barry Bain, bless his soul, he departed last year, and called the Requirements Properties Matrix. So I, this is an engineering idea, having a matrix to look at complex systems. And every year I went back to TRW Systems in California and said, I've made a little improvement to your basic idea. And one year, the idea was evidence. I said, you know, not just come up with a number, but give the evidence for the number. And so I evolved this impact estimation table over many decades of, if you like, trials with interested parties. And it got to the stage where it, uh, among other things, we could fully automate it, although spreadsheets are a very good first pre-automation of it. We used those in the early days. And now we have apps yeah. that know what evidence is and what to do with it and things like that. Next stage will be artificial intelligence that will decipher the quality of the evidence and the source. I'm, I'm not joking. We're, we're working on it. Nice. So on page 20 of your book, Tom, you talk about value level constraints. Basically, what you're saying is you might have, say, three strategies, but only one of them works within all the constraints. So that's all you should really yeah. focus on, I think, is what you're trying to say. Or, or try to relax or remove the constraints. Let's just yeah. say for sake of argument that list. one of the strategies which is outside, which is outside the limit, is 10 times more profitable. And let's just say that with using your imagination and redesigning something, you can, in fact, relax the constraint and get something 10 times more profitable than relaxing the constraints is the smart thing to do. You talk about long-term objectives on page 23. I find this interesting because these days I find so much of an addiction to the short term, but you are talking about that here. You're saying some stakeholder values are mainly interested in the long term, not immediately. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you were thinking there? Because you're talking about mature planners Versus, I guess, immature right. planners. <laughs> well, let, let me, for our, since we're in a techie session here, let me bring in the concept of technical debt, which I think everybody knows about and oh, everybody yeah. realizes yeah. is a huge yeah. cost and a threat to your agility to compete with your products and services. So now, why is this? Well, it's because we were short term and nobody stopped us. No chief technical officer insisted on engineering the system to have low technical debt which he could have but he didn't okay failure of technical management okay i don't blame a programmer for that now long-term objectives take something in this example here we have a whole arm called adaptability with things like upgradability portability extendability etc now by definition these are things that are not your immediate concern. Your immediate concern is building stuff, getting out that first version. But for the lifetime of the system, which could be 10, 20, 30 years, think uh, an air traffic control system here, the major costs and major problems will be the adaptability of the system as initially built. And you have to build a system to be easily adaptable. Now, that's architecture. That's engineering. It is most certainly not coding. It is most certainly not removing bad code, as some seem to think. Okay. So somebody has to grow up. If you're building an air traffic control system for Europe, I've worked on those systems. Somebody needs to say, we have to look ahead to the lifetime of the system, to making it easy to maintain safely, to fix bugs safely, etc. And we have to set quantified objectives. One of my clients, confirm it, set 10 different quantified values, which they said, that's the set of things we call technical debt. And at one week, every month, they use their weekly cycle 
to work on that technical debt. That is to redesign, redesign, redesign the system so it was easier and easier and easier for them to maintain and fix. By the way, they woke up to this necessity eight years after launch of the project. A bit late, but then they knew they had a catastrophic problem on their hands. You know, uh, it would bring death to the whole company. So they then made the regular investment. You can't change everything in an old system instantaneously, but you can spend a week, a month for the rest of history, making it a really low technical debt system. Yeah, that's a good point, actually. Yeah, it brings me on to the Laws of Project Success on page 45. Really like this. You've got Gilb's Laws of Project Success. Number one, if you've not defined progress clearly, then it is impossible to reach it. Yeah. <laughs> Conscious design beats random conventional construction. That ties in with the book, how big things get done as well, doesn't it? I try to uh, mm-hmm. deal with things when they're easier to fix, I guess. Uh, number three, if potential problems are solved or prevented early, then that is far more cost effective than reacting to failure threats much later. That wisdom has been out for quite a while, but a lot of people forgot about that. <laughs> people used to talk about that a lot in my, in my career, but they've, I don't I don't hear it anymore. Yeah, I, we should hear it more often. What, what went ideal wrong? requirement levels require... I know, yeah. <laughs> so ideal requirement levels require infinite resources. Balancing conflicting requirements would be more successful than disappointing multiple unreasonable target expectations. So this is where having what's intolerable, tolerable, what the goal is, what the stretch is, that's where it's crucial, right? Because you've got your meter and your scale and all that kind of stuff. And Mm -hmm. a disciplined engineering approach is the most cost-effective method for reaching success and keeping it. And scientific methods also apply to industrial and public service projects. You talked a lot actually in the book as well about systems thinking and hypotheses and so on. But then you have the ethics of success on page 46, which I'm going to read to you. And so we will always tell our client the full truth in writing. In writing, I think is really crucial there. We will mm-hmm. always offer to do things in the client's real long term best interest, explaining why. And in spite of their instructions to the contrary, sometimes they do ask us to do something harmful. <laughs> and if a client insists on acting or instructing us in a manner that will probably lead to failure or, or serious lack of success, then we will regretfully resign from the assignment. Yeah, I agree with that, giving your reasons in writing. Also, you wouldn't leave any doubt about why you left, Tom. You'd make it clear. Yes, but it's your ethical obligation yeah. as an outsider consultant to explain why up front. By the way, with a bit of luck, you'll get the following reaction from higher up. Explain this slowly and they'll bring you back and do what you say. Or they'll try somebody else and totally fail and then they'll bring you back. I've been brought back. Okay. Be the one who got it right. Yeah. Management needs people they can trust to tell them the bad news early so they can act on it. And on page 56, there's a section there decomposing stakeholder needs. So a lot of people think, oh, we're going to spend a few months kind of sorting this out and we'll we'll do uh, some release whenever, four or five months time. But actually, you're saying separate the most critical needs for early delivery, maybe even in the next couple of weeks. Do critical stuff early. Yeah. Tom, what would be the most memorable examples that you have of that? If you, you have, if you have some examples that you don't give any secrets away, you don't have to name the organization uh, or anything like that, no, or no, even the no. industry. But do you recall sometimes where you actually surprise people with how much value <coughs> you produced within a week, for example? Okay. Now, I have a whole case study that is in writing, and you'll find it in references in my books. It's from the U.S. Army Department of Defense Persinscom which is the U.S. Army personnel system. They were in an embarrassing situation. General Schwarzkopf, at the end of the initial war in Iraq, had said that their IT system, which was eight years old, was so terrible that it gave him the wrong answer late, and he could do just as well looking out the window and counting soldiers to get the right answer quickly. So that was pretty embarrassing after having spent a few million dollars. So I was charged with saving this whole IT project, and I used what I call my startup week. You'll find plenty of writings on that in the references in the various books. And I flew into Washington, 
for one week. And I said, I'm out of here at the end of the week. So you're on your own. So let's do the best we can. And on Monday, we quantified the top 10 critical objectives with the help of the 12 key people on the project in the room with me. Mm. Tuesday, Mm. they brainstormed the top 10 strategies. Wednesday, we did an impact estimation table to see the power of the strategies on the goals and the costs. And then Thursday is the day where we pull off a miracle. Basically, it's where we say, is there some little sliver of action we can do next week to actually make this real IT system really better in at least one of the value objectives numerically, right? So, you know, there was, can you do a miracle in this really big bang environment? It turns out there were several things we could do that could be done next week. But they said, uh, t- Tom, we've got a really interesting solution here. And I said, what's that? We discovered that the reason the general got a late answer from the IT system, he was that the IT system put the general at the back of the queue of 15,000 others of his soldiers inquiring of the same system. And you can imagine that gives a late reply to the general. And it's immediately obvious what we're going to do, right, if general then move to head of Q. So it doesn't sound too difficult. And I said, can you do that next week? And they said, yes. And I'm very, very skeptical because, you know, a small change could have massive mandated uh, testing for weeks before it's allowed to be released. Just because it's one line of code doesn't mean it can be released next week. And I said, are you sure you can do it by the end of next week? Because I want to deliver to the general a real improvement next week. And they said, yes. And I said, how can you be so damn sure, Tom? And they said, because we already did it. End of short story about miracles delivered while we're in the planning mode. Nice. I'm going to close today's interview by reading a section that I think really has some gold nuggets for practitioners listening. And then we'll just have a quick chat before we wrap up today. But basically, some stakeholders are more critical to your system than others. Yeah, that makes sense. Some stakeholder needs are more critical to your system than others. That also makes a lot of sense, but a lot of people forget that. Stakeholders are undisciplined. They may not know all their needs or know them precisely or know their value, but they can be analyzed, coached and helped to get the best possible deal. So I'm gathering there's going to be lots of coaching tips that you might have for people to be able to kind of get that out of people. I'm going to ask you for a story on that before we wrap up today. Stakeholders may be inaccessible, unwilling, inanimate, oppositional, and worse, but we need to deal with them intelligently. Stakeholders might well ask the wrong thing, a means rather than the real ends, but they can be guided to understand that or their requests can be interpreted in their own real best interests. Stakeholders do not want to wait years, get delays, invest shit, loads of money, and get little or no value. Stakeholders cannot have any realistic idea of what their needs and demands will cost to satisfy, so their adopted by you requirements need to be based on value for cost, not on value alone. And if you think you found all critical stakeholders, I think you should assume that there is at least one more. And when you find that one, there's probably one more. <laughs> New stakeholders will emerge and they are not all identified at the beginning. If you think you found all the critical needs of a stakeholder, there will always be at least one more need hiding. If you do not understand and act on the principles we just talked about, you might blame your failure on system complexity and the unexpected and wicked problems, but in reality, it's your own fault and responsibility. Deal with it upfront and constantly thereafter. Yes. So top. Hearty, that reminds yes. me. To, <laughs> <laughs> I need to ask you about an example where a client came to you and they basically told you the means, but not the ends. Without giving any secrets away, Tom, can you think of a story where someone said, I want blah, but actually it wasn't blah. They wanted actually to do something else. An improved question <laughs> would be, could I ever think of an instance where they actually came to me with their critical values? and not some preconceived notion of how to build it or do it. (laughs) I'm serious. It is the exception. (laughs) Now, what's happened in the background is the forces that be, the staff who wants the new kit and new programming languages to play with and the new database stuff, and the suppliers, 
bless them, who want to sell their services and kit, read The Big Con, new book on the consultancies. All the, the uh, as Eisenhower called them, the military industrial evil forces. I didn't use the word evil, but he meant it. And they have conspired to get you to buy and build something which will be late, will cost far too much, will fail enormously, will steal resources from other good systems, and basically is corrupting society. I refer again to the book, The Big Con, that came out this year. I've just read it. Now, so all these forces have, uh, by the way, they've learned to gang up on the executive group and make them believe they're doing the right thing. Okay? So it is with a little bit of difficulty, we start the conversation, yes, but exactly what do you hope to achieve? And say, well, we're going to, you know, all these good things that these consultants said we'd get, you know, competitiveness and competitive edge and flexibility and agility and, and no, 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 no. That's fine, but how much competitiveness, how much competitive edge, how much agility, you know? A lot of it. Now, come on, that's bullshit and you know it. Yeah, but what can we do about that? You can quantify <laughs> it. And one delightful thing, say what you like about managers, but at the top are, unless they haven't been replaced recently, are some pretty smart cookies who just need to know that somebody might help them break this logjam and quantify their critical objectives. And so I happily work with those people. I, you know, every once in a while, on the day, I get the go-ahead. For God's sake, let's quantify all our critical objectives and move on. They were not taught at their business school university that they could quantify all critical objectives. They were brought up with a balanced scorecard thinking that improved quality was good enough a specification. Fail. Failure of our educational institutions you, Tom, and, for managers. And I, I don't just see the value from your work in terms of clarifying what value, what problems need to be solved, opportunities, but also I see useful as well for designing experiments. And you do talk a lot about experiments and hypothesis in particular in the book. And I see value there as well because between using your work to actually be clear about what we think we should build and being clear about what our hypotheses are so we can better learn about what we should build, I see a lot of value here. And I think it's something that needs to come back more in vogue, Tom. And I'm hoping some listeners here will look up at the resources that I will post in the podcast and YouTube descriptions as soon as it's published. Thank you so much for coming on the Agility Island podcast, Tom. Thanks for inviting me. Let's hope we convince one smart person to do at least one better thing. Wouldn't that be nice? Thank you.